You can't deny 2023 was a wild year. ChatGPT made an immediate impact on the world. War and conflict intensified across the globe. And in a weird twist of fate, a submersible was imploding at the same time Hollywood was. In the realm of entertainment, Disney and Bob Iger lost $1.4 billion at the box office and had to finally face facts. Their critics have been right all along, and now even the lapdog media have turned on them. Go f yourself. Hey, Bob. If you're in the audience. The past several years were filled with terrible productions, inflated budgets, and brand overexposure across the board for Disney. Accompanied by a smug cloud thicker than Hillary Duff when it came to dealing with criticism. Haters and shambles, they stay picking the corn out of my shit. They absolutely dominated for a decade straight, but have lost over $170 billion in market cap since 2020. And 2023 was one of their worst years in company history. After Indiana Jones 5 wet the bed last summer, Disney rounded out the second half of the year with an absolute reception to their latest Star Wars loot drop of a television show, and their last MCU release kept people out of the theaters better than the 2020 lockdowns. Things don't look better as they enter the new year, and Bob Iger, Disney's leader who once seemed like he could do no wrong, I got Midas touch, fuck boy. I'm at the bank, about to withdraw all of it. Can't hide behind gobbled up IPs like Star Wars or multi-billion dollar studio purchases like Fox this time around. The start of the year has turned into a bit of a chuckle fest because of the Steamboat Willie version of Mickey Mouse entering the public domain, and all the horror movie related releases that were announced almost immediately. Seeing Disney's mascot bastardized publicly when they're there's nothing they can do about it. I don't know, that shit's very funny to me. Disney has been the media leader in Hollywood for years, but for the first time in recent memory, Universal claimed the top spot at the worldwide box office. The Super Mario Brothers movie and Oppenheimer led the way for them, forcing Disney into second place with Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 as their lone success story of last year. But they are far more than just a movie production company. They're a media company that owns a dozen theme parks around the world, and that's where they make most of their money. So how could they be on such a decline? Two thirds of their gross income every year come from those parks, but people go there because of the intellectual properties they own. Disney cultivated a wholesome family image over a period of decades, turning them into an iconic and welcome brand. That's what the movies and television shows and toys and collectibles are for, to make people wanna to go to those parks where the real money is. So what happens when people stop caring about the movies? They stop caring about the IPs and they stop going to the parks. And uh, price gouging probably doesn't help. As we are talking about movies, and before diving into the fiasco surrounding Bob Iger's return, a quick word about this video's sponsor, Rokid. If you ever want to watch your favorite shows or streaming movies on the big screen, or maybe rewatch some old favorites in the theater again, the Rokid Max AR glasses deliver an immersive cinematic experience anywhere you want. Basically a massive 360 inch screen that's a private cinema. And instead of going full dystopia, you're still connected to the outside world. The Rokid Joypack comes with the glasses and station and is the world's first Google certified Android TV device for AR glasses, offering a wealth of content from YouTube, Amazon Prime, and all the other streamers we pay way too much for. The Roka glasses themselves are lightweight and comfortable and the micro OLED display is beautiful. They weigh practically nothing at 76 grams and they come with low blue light and low glare features. The station itself is also compact. A little sucker can fit right in your pocket. Rounding out features are a 120 hertz refresh rate and easy switching between 2D and 3D. If you want to try a portable cinematic experience through a personal home theater, click the link in the description to try the Roka Joy Pack that includes the glasses and station. Thanks to Rokid for sponsoring this video and now back to it. Bob Iger returned to the company as CEO in November 2022 to right the ship and has said some interesting things, but here we are a year later and Disney's film and streaming divisions are spiraling down the toilet. And he certainly didn't do himself any favors when he decided to make enemies with writers and actors during the strike in Hollywood last year. There's a level of expectation that they have that is just not realistic. Like any leader, the guy is scrutinized, and rightfully so. I'm sure he's a nice guy in real life. He's, he's gay. He has a special connection to classical music. There's many things that are interesting about him. But he returned to correct a problem he started, so it's odd to listen to the blame shift. He simultaneously acknowledged the core issues that are affecting their movie productions. Um, I like being able to do that. Entertain, and if you can infuse it with positive messages, have a good impact on the world, 
fantastic, but that should not be the objective. While pretending that's entirely the fault of his immediate predecessor Bob Chapek, the person Iger personally handpicked. Even though Iger selected him nearly two years in advance, once Chapek took the reins, Iger refused to give them up and even admitted so, stating to the New York Times during COVID that a crisis of this magnitude and its impact on Disney would necessarily result in my actively helping Bob and the company contend with it, particularly since I ran the company for 15 years. It seems at no point did Iger ever really walk away. He popped up again in 2000. 2021 to help with the Scarlett Johansson Black Widow salary dispute when the film's box office was argued to be affected by its simultaneous release on Disney Plus, skewing her earning potential. And there was more behind-the-scenes contention before Iger's initial departure, more than anyone knew. Reports have surfaced about petty squabbling between a couple multi-millionaires, about Iger giving up his private, expansive office at Disney's Burbank headquarters that had a personal shower. A company's collapsing, the world's on fire, but where is this millionaire's private office shower, you barbarians? Since his return, Iger has thrown Chapek under the bus at every opportunity, and it's pretty hilarious. But Bob Chapek's in that role. Yes. And you were thinking what? Um, I, was, I was disappointed in what I was seeing. <laughs> The guy handpicked Chapek as his predecessor, regretted it, and used him as the scapegoat for the result of every decision Iger himself made. Hello, darkness, my old friend. There's a balance between art and commerce, and the problems with Disney's media output, specifically the decision to prioritize social issues over art by hiring activists instead of artists. So much of why, if you go to the movies, so many big movies just not good. It's because they're they're not being made by a person who cares about it. They're being made by people who are trying to make something that they think someone else is going to like. Mm. And that's not how art works. Art doesn't, that's something else. It's not art. That's commerce. That falls on the CEO, and it started happening well before Chapek's short reign. The signs were there dating back to 2015, and became clearer with The Last Jedi during the heyday of Iger's run of nostalgic terror. So while Bobby I shits on Bobby C for all of the troubles Disney's facing, he's really just cleaning up after himself, or trying to. Iger suggested they'd start steering away from message-focused movies and stick to entertainment, but time will tell if he's just paying lip service or not. Either way, the movies released in 2023 were already in production and there wasn't much that could be done. Reshoots happened more often than usual, like the attempts to make the Marvels more appealing, before it flew too close to the sun anyway, burning up and dying at the box office. Drops in revenue and limited time to course correct aren't the only issues Bob Iger's facing. Every villain needs a hero, and Iger's biggest enemy right now is a man by the name of Nelson Peltz. Peltz is actually the ultimate Iger troll, and not just a thorn in Iger's side, but like one of those flesh wounds the heroes get in movies where it's bad enough that it incapacitates them, but you know it's not enough to kill them. You know the one. Peltz is the antithesis of everything Iger's been trying to build the past decade. Midnight's Edge called him an anti-activist, which sounds pretty accurate. He's a billionaire investor and activist. Genius billionaire playboy philanthropist. But not that kind of activist. His role is described as such because he actively wants to shift the direction Disney's going, and that's kind of what he does. He's a major investor who's pushing for shareholder seats. You know the company's gone and fucked up when the lapdog media that was sniffing their farts for them and telling the world how good they smelled are writing articles about how Nelson Peltz is pushing for the right moves at Disney. This guy's crawled so far up Iger's ass at this point he could use him like a sock puppet or wear him as a skin suit. He's at this point nominated himself to be on the board, which with his hedge fund holding $3 billion in Disney stock, he feels like he should have a voice. In essence, what he wants is for Disney leadership, specifically Iger, to be held accountable for the failings of the company. In a scathing letter to Disney's board, activist investor Ancora on behalf of Peltz wrote, A degree of shareholder-driven change is certainly warranted in Disney's boardroom, following an extended period of absent-minded governance, ineffective succession planning, polarizing actions, and sustained value destruction. While it has been argued that challenges largely stem from the tenure of Bob Chapek, the board was in the driver's seat before, during, and after that time. See? They feel the same way we've all felt for years. These people get it. Peltz and his hedge fund that has billions invested have been attacking Iger for months and it isn't letting up. 
In another written request, they asked for a full breakdown to shareholders on the nature and extent of Disney's dependency and vulnerability to China as they own multiple theme parks and CCP territories. Uncovering that sort of thing would be awfully risky for Disney. I'm sure we've all seen the South Park episode. Bob Iger's crowning achievement wasn't buying Marvel or Lucasfilm, it was putting a Disneyland in Shanghai. And we don't have the numbers, but they wouldn't be allowed to operate there without the CCP owning more than 50% of it. While being pulled in the direction of the CCP, another acronym has been haunting the company. DEI, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. The three biggest corporations on planet Earth, BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street, corporations whose collective value is so enormous that when you Google any of the three, the first article that pulls up calls them arguably the biggest cartel in human history, and they own an 18 plus percent stake in Disney. They are so powerful that they pretty much own a major portion of everything, and what they say goes, and what they care about is DEI and ESG. Disney answers to many masters because its ultimate goal is to make money, even if those masters are a communist government on one hand, and a hyper-progressive corporate mafia on the other. Nelson Peltz might have a few billion invested, but one can see the uphill battle he has. And I've joked a lot recently that the mainstream media finally caught up with YouTubers, but that's actually pretty typical and unsurprising now. Major media outlets finally started criticizing Disney once it was absolutely safe to. Once it became clear the company was having a horrendous year, it was finally okay for the mainstream to call out the obvious. Fans had seen the writing on the wall for years and had been blamed for their troubles. Disney films would pull a bait and switch, using the name of a popular character to sell a movie, then relegate that character to a supporting role to prop up some new Mary Sue-esque self-insert. And if you didn't like that, you're probably like sexist or something. Don't like Mary Sue? You're problematic. That's wrong thing. It's actually a really good movie if you're not ableist. Most projects in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and a number of them from the Star Wars IP, have gone through this effect. And it's been going on since the end of Phase 3 of the MCU, and the cracks were showing before that. My last video was about Disney's mismanagement of Star Wars and the direct effects DEI has had on that franchise specifically, but it's a company-wide problem. 2022 was the year the IST defense went into overdrive, the reactions to She-Hulk and Obi-Wan Kenobi come to mind, and Disney's crazy blitz to disgrace its own fans that came along with them. At one point, the official Star Wars Twitter account unleashed the hounds on an unsuspecting user with like 20 followers, misconstruing what they said and drawing the attention of thousands of bots, I mean fans of modern Star Wars, to attack the poor person. How absolutely gross and unprofessional it was for Disney to allow such a thing to happen is emblematic of how the company handled any criticism. That was barely a year ago. And now what is it that Bob Iger is saying? Oh yeah, that their creatives have lost their way because they should be there to entertain, not spread a message. Company directly attacks a person for pointing out a problem. Then a year later, the leader of that company states the problem as fact, like he just discovered it himself. That last sentence sums up Disney's last five years. The company's entire situation is something to behold as a spectator, but I'm specifically interested in their film and television departments. All the problems start at the top and the choices the CEO ultimately makes, and I want to take a look at what the outcomes of those projects were after the decisions were made. Because we are talking more than $1,400,000,000 lost at the box office last year. Very impressive. To put in perspective how bad it got, Avatar 2 made $230 million of its total box office last year, despite being a 2022 release, making it Disney's biggest film of that year and also one of their top films of 2023. I don't know how else to paint this picture other than to say, that's fucking crazy. Not talked about much though, was The Haunted Mansion. It had a $117 million box office haul on a $150 million budget. And that does not include marketing costs, which typically cost in the nine figures themselves and can match or exceed the budget itself. It's reasonable to assume its break-even point was at least $500 million. And it made 117. Ooh. A movie that successfully managed to only lose a little bit of money was Elemental. It was initially declared a flop, which it still is, but okay. See, it had a $200 million budget, and articles were pumped out about it successfully breaking even once it hit $500 million at the box office. It did make its budget back, but none of these articles take the marketing budget into account. It still flopped. That's how it works. And Little Mermaid read its way into theaters at a $450 million cost between production budget and marketing and needed at least $800 million to break even, more like $900, so it made $570 million. Ouch. 
I'm sure you're seeing a pattern here. Hyper-budgeted movies absolutely shitting themselves because the studio thought it was still 2019 and everything they produced would hit a billion dollars. I covered Indiana Jones and Ant-Man 3 in other videos, but to summarize, those cost a combined $750 million to make and market, and made a combined $850 million. How much of a disaster Indiana Jones 5 was absolutely cannot be understated, but that's nothing compared to what happened at the end of the year. The Marvels released on November 8th in theaters, making the impact of a wet fart and thrown in the trash like the undies you left it in. After using a smokescreen to hand away why Phase 4 sucked ass, Marvel Studios decided out of the blue that Black Panther Wakanda Forever would be the last movie of the phase, and Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania would be the first movie of Phase 5. It's the same tactic Marvel uses in the comics when they relaunch a series with a new number one on the cover, because everyone loves a fresh start. But Ant-Man 3 didn't fix anything. It was more of the same, and that same was shitty. As these things were happening, the Marvels kept getting its release date pushed back. Disney and Marvel Studios were unhappy with the movie, and the thrust of the agenda push of Phase 4 wasn't going to fly. The writing was on the wall well before the end of the year, and whether Disney wanted to admit it out loud or not, the company was showing distrust in their own movie and television sector. Another calamity around the same time as the Marvels was their animated movie Wish, which, you guessed it, cost $200 million to make, $100 million plus was spent on marketing, and it made $260 million at the global box office. Even though some movies were bigger overall financial losers than others, my pick for the most meaningful flop is most definitely the Marvels. Everyone saw it a mile away, but it doesn't change the result. It was a fucking disaster, and the fallout will shift Marvel Studios going forward. It's the first MCU movie to finish under $100 million at the domestic box office. It's the sequel to a movie that made $1.1 billion, yet it barely made a quarter of that. Whether it was fan blaming, lockdown blaming, or anything and everything in between, the numbers don't lie. People stopped seeing the MCU as a collection of separate franchises that crossed for major events. The Marvel might as well have been the follow-up to Ant-Man 3 for all anyone cared. An apathetic box office reflected that. Each MCU project since Phase 4 seemed more like the last than it ever had. A difficult task for a franchise constantly criticized for each movie feeling too similar in tone. But now the films don't even have great characters and enigmatic actors to make up for times when the stories are stale. And cut and paste all this and apply it to Star Wars and you have the explanation for what's going on over there too. As much as Bob Iger received credit for the enormous jump in Disney's value over the first 15 years of his tenure, and as much scrutiny as he's receiving now for all of his missteps, one thing gets lost in the noise a little. The major miscalculation of investing in the direct-to-consumer market. Disney Plus was the saving grace for the company during the pandemic, but it's become a nightmare. This is a lesson most of Hollywood seems to be learning, not just Disney, but they are the biggest game in town. Other studios who poured billions and billions into their own services weren't walking away from the kind of deals Disney was, with their ownership of ESPN and the Disney Channel making them tons of money through cable bundles. Deciding to become self-reliant, they moved ESPN and cable Disney content to their own apps, which seemed risky because they don't have a revenue sharing model, but direct-to-consumer meant they'd reap all the rewards. Here's an example of what I mean. Revenue sharing is how smaller market teams in sports coexist with massively popular teams. For example, in the NBA, the Lakers have a much bigger fan base and make way more money than the Memphis Grizzlies. But because of revenue sharing, the Grizzlies get a fair share and split. If they were to be independent and still somehow remain in the NBA, they'd probably flounder in no time. And that's what's happening to Disney Plus and ESPN Plus now that Disney has decided to move on from cable and into streaming. They also tried a half-assed transition of theater to streaming, like Black Widow or Mulan, or dumping Pixar movies onto the platform in the hopes to boost subscriber numbers. It's all led to major financial losses. It's like Disney missed the obvious challenges these things create. If you're concentrating all of your media onto a streaming platform, you're not just competing with the home shopping network on cable or the indie movie in the theater screening next door. It's all concentrated on a phone, iPad, or TV, where Disney's competing with YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, and a billion other things to eat up people's attention. At least if someone was committed to going to the theater, the odds of them seeing a Disney movie if it was there are high. But if I'm sitting at home, I'd rather watch this wrestling documentary on YouTube about Stone Cold, made by a guy with a $100 microphone over Disney's latest $200 million agenda-pushing slop. With all of this turmoil, Bob Iger's made some major decisions going into the new year with shakeups all over their media landscape. As far as the MCU is concerned, the entire universe has been put on hiatus for 2024. They quietly dumped the turd that is Echo earlier this month, and only have one release heading to the cinema, and it's not even finished yet. 
Deadpool 3. That's as much of a guarantee as you can get, with Hugh Jackman's last run as Wolverine even getting a cynical man like me pressing his nostalgia buttons for some dopamine. Iger and Disney probably hope the gap in time will relieve the sour taste in people's mouths too, and maybe they'll figure something out behind the scenes and change the trajectory of the MCU for the better. But too little too late, most likely. Audiences take a while to win back, and considering how much these movies cost to make, I don't know how many more financial blows Disney can muster to get through the storm, even if they start making good movies again. And the lack of production isn't just for the sake of quality over quantity, it's to cut costs, and Iger's talked about it as such. That Ironheart show nobody asked for? On indefinite hiatus. She-Hulk season 2? Not happening. The list goes on, and whatever happens next will be interesting. Will Iger really try and steer the company away from the agenda-driven narratives and back to creativity meeting commerce? We'll see. But the Ray movie's still moving forward, so signals are mixed at best. The director is still talking about being the first woman in something like the trend just picked up yesterday, and there are rumors Disney's unhappy about it, but they haven't made any moves publicly to distance themselves from it. Actions speak louder than words, and Iger said the right things, but nothing's changed at all so far. If anything, it's like the company's dug their little cowboy boots in more. I'll be surprised if anything major does change. DEI still rules in Hollywood, and that's not going anywhere. If there is a company that can buck the trend because of the financial might it still wields compared to its competitors, it's Disney. But it hasn't been a trailblazer in decades. It's an acquisition specialist, prioritizing picking the corpse of franchises they've milked to death over doing anything new or creative. The company's gone from 19 major cinema releases last year to only a handful in 2024. But a more focused release schedule doesn't necessarily mean the movies will be good. Time will tell because they're following the same formula. Tried and true franchises like the ninth installment in the Alien franchise, a Planet of the Apes sequel, and a prequel slash sequel to the live action Lion King remake. Are they focused on quality or does that sound like business as usual? You tell us, Bob. GG's. I got Midas touch, fuckboy. I'm at the bank about to withdraw all of it.